You're live. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Council Leader Dave Stewart speaking, um, and I'm tonight chairing the final meeting of the Cabinet um, before the election that's due Thursday, the 11th of March, five o'clock. Um, and before we start the formal meeting, um, I wish to announce that it is with great sadness that I today uh, inform members and other people of the sudden and unexpected death of Councillor Adrian Axford. Members will know he was recovering from a stroke and I understand that he was taken ill uh, during the night and passed away in his sleep. I'm going to ask everybody if they would just uh, accept a moment, a minute silence uh, in respect of Adrian. everybody. On behalf of all the members, I'm sure all other people who have had any dealings with Adrian will know this is a sad loss of someone who has been a councillor locally and for the Isle of Wight Council for some time and has given so much to his community and he will be sadly missed. And I wish to publicly extend my condolences to his family at this very sad time and to offer any support that may be needed at this difficult time. So thank you members. I'll now return to the agenda. The first item on the agenda is the minutes. Um, are members happy for me to confirm these as a true and accurate record of the meeting? Yeah. This was the meeting of the 11th of February. Yeah. I'll propose those, Dave. Councillor Bain will propose those. Thank you, Paul. Second, Barry O. Councillor Abraham. Thank you, Barry. Um, so that's dealt with. Are there any Item two, declarations of interest, which members wish to declare that they might have in relation to matters on the agenda. I have, Chairman, um, on the matters of Ride Harbour. I am the Ward Councillor for Ride Town Council and the Isle of Wight Council. So I will uh, abstain from the vote and leave the meeting while you debate. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Chairman, it's the, Chief, Chairman, it's the Chief Executive, just for those people who may be watching, that was Councillor Whittle making a declaration. Sorry, yes, OK, thank you for that. Um, I'm now going to turn to public questions, if you can just bear with me while I um, bring the public questions up. Uh, we have two public questions. The first one is from Mr Mark Voller. I'll read the question and this one I'll invite Councillor Hastings to respond to. Recently, the severe cutting of trees at various island locations has caused alarm. Whilst accepting that some tree work uh, is uh, are needed, do councillors and officers have active oversight of these operations to ensure the character, heritage and beauty of our public spaces are preserved or is it being left to the contractors? Steve, are you happy to deal with that? Yes, Rita. Just wait a few seconds for it to go live. Thank you, Leader. Yeah, um, my condolences also to the uh, to Councillor Axford's family. Sorry to hear that news. The, the answer to the question is, the Isle of Wight Council is proud to be the custodian of woodlands and trees across the island and we understand the social, cultural, environmental and economic value of our trees and woodlands. Our trees are regularly assessed by competent tree experts 
and work is carefully specified and monitored by trained staff. Sometimes work on our tree stock is required to keep the public safe. We want to increase tree cover on, on council land by planting more trees in the future and working with local people to conserve and enhance our natural assets for generations to come. Thank you, Leader. Thank you very much. The other question I have is from a Mr. Bob Blezard, um, which reads, on the 25th of November 2015, my motion to council requiring it to continue <coughs> paying town and parish councils their due proportion of the council tax support grant received from government was overwhelmingly carried, supported by the current leader and other cabinet members. Next year's CTSG to the Isle of Wight Council is 1.4 million, as stated in the letter from Councillor Stewart to the IWELC, although contrary to Brian Tyndall's report to Council on the 20th of January 2021, which states in paragraph 7, it is no longer possible to identify the amount of funding that specifically relates to CTS. Given that the amount of CTS used to mitigate the reduction in the council tax base amounts to £946,000, why is the council not honouring its 2015 commitment by passing some of the remainder of the grant to parishes, recognising that parish tax bases have also reduced? And I'll ask Councillor Tyndall, who's our Lead Member for Resources and Finance to respond, please. Thank you, Leader. Can you just tell me when I'm live because I'm going to be reading off my screen and I can't do both. Yeah, you're live now. OK, this is quite a long uh, response, so just bear with me. Take your time. Yeah, it is important to recognise that the council tax support grant to town and parish councils provided historically from the Isle of Wight Council is unrelated to, in inverted commas, one-off government grant provided for 2021 to 2022 of 1.4 million entitled Local ta Council Tax Support Grant. Taking these in turn, number one, Council Tax Support Grant to Town and Parish Councils. That's the title. First bullet point, in 2013 stroke 14 brackets, I believe, close brackets, there was a change from council tax benefit, which was fully funded by government subsidy to the local town council tax support scheme or L LCTS, which was to be funded by local councils. Next bullet point. On transfer, local councils had their general funding increased by 90% of the subsidy. From that point onwards, general funding has been subject to uh, subject annual reductions. Next bullet point. As Councillor Tyndall, me, mentioned in his report on the local council tax support scheme to council in January of this year, it is not possible to identify how much funding is embedded within the general funding relating to council tax support. Next bullet point. The amount estimated by the council as the LCTS funding for town and parish councils embedded within general funding is £31,000. Next bullet point. The amount estimated by the Council of LCTS funding embedded into general funding for the Isle of Wight Council is 5.6 million versus a cost of 8.8 .8 million, leaving a shortfall of 3.2 million, that's pounds by the way, in the current year. And in brackets, before the ch changes to LCTS approved in January 2021, close brackets. Item number two. Local council tax support dash 1.4 million for one off grant for 2021 stroke 22 only. First bullet point, government have announced a 1.4 million pound grant for the Isle of Wight Council entitled local council tax support grant and have stated the following. And in quotes, broadly, we expect that the funding will meet the additional costs associated with increases in local council tax support caseloads in 21 to 22. Decisions on local council tax support scheme design for 21-22 will be for billing authorities to take as usual in consultation with their major precepts, precepting authorities and the public. Close, 
quotes. Next bullet point. The loss of council tax income from 20, 2021 stroke 22 arising from the reduction in the ca council tax base is, as mentioned, uh, nine, £946,000, much of which relates to an expected increase in LCTS caseload. Next bullet point. In addition, there is a deficit on the council tax collection, sorry, the council tax collection fund of 2.4 million, of which 2.1 million pounds falls to the Isle of Wight Council to find. Next bullet point, all of the financial risks associated with additional costs of LCTS or non-collecting of council tax falls to Isle of Wight Council, and in brackets 86%, Police 11%, fire 3%, with none fall into the town and parish councils. If the town and parish councils were required to contribute towards the collection fund deficit of £2.4 million, their share would have been £113,000. Next bullet point. The £1.4 million grant and the saving relating to the ceasing of the grant to of £31,000 to town and parish councils was considered in the context of the following. The reduction in the council tax base of £946,000. Next, the council tax collection fund deficit of £2.1 million, none of, none of which is shared with town and parish councils. But if town and parish councils were required to contribute to their share, it would have been £113,000. The above taken together being a deficit in excess of £3 million. The risk of LCTS caseload to increase beyond that already budgeted due to rising unemployment levels once the furlough scheme ends. Final point that the reduction in the council tax base of £946,000 will take time to recover as the economy recovers and therefore shortfalls will be likely in the next two to three years. That's the end of the reply, Leader. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Tyndall. Um, I move on now to item four, Chairman's announcements. Um, I've got two announcements. I firstly wish to express my disappointment. Uh, Councillor Cameron Palin from East Cowes has, without my permission, used a picture of myself and Councillor Henry in one of his political leaflets. I do so because it shows myself and Councillor Henry meeting together some time ago, well before the COVID restrictions, but has no statement explaining this and explain this was not a breach of regulations. I would like apology from him and whoever else was involved in this detrimental conduct. And if appropriate, I shall be referring the matter to the Electoral Commission for guidance. I raise this because I believe it is crucial that even during the forthcoming elections, all candidates are treated with dignity and respect and do not act in a way which unnecessarily puts our community at risk. Finally, I wish to update members on the progress being made with engagement with the MHCLG, that's the um, government, on the island deal. Whilst I cannot go into detail, I can say that a positive approach has been taken by all parties involved to develop the scope of the work required, and the briefings I have had indicate that this could well have a positive outcome for the island. As soon as I have more information on this matter, I will ensure members are duly updated. We move now to the cabinet agenda items which were considered at scrutiny. I believe Councillor Hollis is in virtual attendance. Uh, we had a full debate on all agenda items at scrutiny and all members had the opportunity to speak should they have wished to do so. So I won't invite them to do it again. However, I will invite Councillor Hollis as Chair of Scrutiny to comment on any matters that were heard before scrutiny that he may wish to comment upon. Councillor Hollis, are you there? Uh, yes, I am, uh, Councillor Stewart. Right, I'm live. Uh, yes, um, I believe that you've had the um, recommendations and outcomes arising from the Corporate Scrutiny Committee. I have to say that it was uh, us very frustrating for all members that we could not uh, delve deeper into the uh, situation with the floating bridge. But uh, there we are. The recommendations are there. Uh, things are noted, things are recommended. Um, there is one thing that I'd like to draw your attention to, which I didn't draw attention to, to the um, 
to the uh, scrutiny committee, but uh, that is a document called the um, it's a local government association. Uh, Councillor's Guide to Procurement. It was written in 2013 and was pertinent at the time of the ordering of the uh, the floating bridge. And if I may just what you just say that the council the kept there's an art there's an item in it it's an important item the councillor's role and it says procurement commissioning and contract management account for such a large proportion of the council's spending and are so critical to the delivery of public services that councillors cannot fail to take a lead i'll leave that there uh, i brought it to your attention now and um, uh, i think it's very pertinent uh, anyway, there you are. You have the recommendations of the um, uh, of the scrutiny committee, and I'll say no more. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hollis. Um, Councillor Hastings, I see you wish to speak as cabinet member. I know you're responsible for procurement. Uh, is there any comment you wish to make on that? Thank you, Leader. Well, I'm, I'm as you know not responsible for procurement now, but of course I was last year. Yeah. My previous role, and I have to say, my only experience of procurement prior to was as a as a supplier to local authorities. So I'd seen it from the other side, but uh, once I was responsible within the council, it became clear to me very quickly, as we have such professionals and uh, uh, our lead officer in procurement is so qualified and so good, I had to keep up with her. So that's the document that I picked up and that's how I knew uh, when we had our monthly meetings and she was talking about procurement and the ins and outs of it. I understood it because I'd read that document, so I can definitely recommend that to all members that get involved in procurement. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that. I'll move on now to item. Five on the agenda, which is the Isle of Wight infrastructure investment plan. Um, and I'll call upon um, Councillor Whittle to speak on this item. Thank you, Leader. Cameras on. Yes. Uh, the Island Investment Plan, the report summarises progress with the Inspiration Island Regeneration Strategy since it was adopted in 2019 and sets out the infrastructure funded need to make further progress. Highlights include the new 250 job call centre in Cowles, the Branston Farm Live Work Scheme and the historic High Street funding. The island has become increasingly attractive as a place to live, work and visit as a result of the pandemic and the range of, and, and the range of housing, business space and infrastructure projects set out in the plan totaling over 100 million will help us capitalise on the in interest in the coming years. The government has now published its prospectus for a levelling up fund and a community renewal fund. These bids of up to 20 million sought by the 12th of June for projects to deliver this coming financial year. Officers will assess the proposals in the investment plan to consider which best meet the criteria and prepare a competitive bid by the published deadline. Having invested over the last four years in the regeneration team and developing a comprehensive regeneration program, we are all well placed to recover from the economic and social impacts of the pandemic and, a, and compete for the funding government intends to provide to assist local areas. So even though regeneration officers are busy working out the new grants, for uh, coming out of lockdown in between that their hands are full and they're working hard leader to get us some more funding for these projects. I'd ask the members of the cabinet to endorse this new investment plan for regeneration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, does any other member wishes to speak? If not, I'll go to the recommendation. OK, uh, the recommendation for this item is that the cabinet should approve, sorry, to approve the island investment plan and appendix. I think we've lost the leader. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> 
proposing the recommendation. Does that have a seconder? Do I have a seconder? I, I will second uh, that, Chairman. Stuart hey Hutchinson. There. Apologies, it's comments. the Chief Executive. You froze when can you hear me? We, we can now. You froze when reading out the recommendation. I'm not sure what's happened. Uh, bear with me. Yes, I think I've lost. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? It may be worth leader rereading out the recommendation because yeah. we lost can you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Yes. No, I think it's not. Leader, do you want me to read out the recommendation? Yes, I'll read out the recommendation. So the recommendation yes, please. The Cabinet to approve the Island Investment Plan Appendix 1 and basis for funding applications to government to assist with the island regeneration and recovery and require annual reports on progress with its implementation. I ask members to support this. You better chair, Chief Executive, if we can't. So, okay. I, leader, I, I think it. I think it may be helpful if you dial out and come back in, uh, leader. Can hear. Yeah. Okay. No. No. I don't know if Councillor Hutch. I don't know if Councillor Hutchinson yeah. would like to take the chair in the meantime. Yeah, uh, I will take the chair. Um, we all heard, I hope, um, Councillor Whittle um, read out the recommendation and cabinet members have that in front of them in writing. Uh, so if we can go round uh, and take a, a vote on that. Would you like me uh, to read the names out? Th that would be Hutchinson. excellent. Thank you. And then if members <laughs> will sig signify simply by agreed or not agreed. OK, um, Councillor Hastings. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. We can. Yes, leader, yeah. Yeah. We're, uh, we're just taking the vote, uh, leader. Thank um, you. And yeah. we're reading the names out now. Yeah. We'll just carry on with that and then leader can resume. So Councillor Hastings. Agreed. Councillor Abraham. Agreed. Councillor Brading. Agreed. Councillor Hutchinson. Agreed. Councillor Mosdale. Agreed. Councillor Peace. Agreed. Councillor Tyndall. Agreed. Councillor Ward. Agreed. Councillor Whittle. Agreed. And Leader. Agreed. That's Please unanimous let me know then. If you have another break and then I'll ask Councillor Hutchinson to carry on. OK, have we dealt with that item? Yeah. Yes, we have, Leader. Thank yeah. you. I'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the Sandown Civic Centre, and I'll ask Councillor Tyndall to speak. Wait for the red, red live. That's OK, I'm live. Yeah, this is the uh, committee report for the disposal of the former Civic Centre and Barracks Sandown to Isle of Wight National Health Service for the provision of a community hub. Uh, the council was approached by the Isle of Wight uh, NHS to purchase a civic centre stroke Barrett's building with funds made available by NHS England. This is going to give us the, uh, the purchase will be with a three hold of the, of the property. So get, this will offer an opportunity to opportunity to achieve a significant, significant capital receipt to the council and also deliver a health uh, community centre hub for the Bay. The paper actually details exactly what the NHS is supposing to do. This was an unutilised building, repurposed and refurbished, providing improving services to local people. That's what they will be doing to it. Um, it will be home to, to the council and the NHS staff joined up as one public service approach, collaborative working. The disposal by the 31st of March 
is necessary and won't put at risk the work of those Isle of Wight staff already operating from the building as the sale will provide for our continual current use in the short term and likely many of those staff will be part of the longer term services supplied from the newly furnished premises. Um, that scrutiny, last scrutiny meeting mention was made that the, the, the council had put aside £800,000 for the refurbishment but it wasn't spent on that. As I said that that meeting and I'll say again now it's the agility of our staff and the professionalism they know what they're doing and they make good they they make ensure that the council get the best results from our property services that's all I have to say leader unless you want me to read out the recommendation uh, I'll do that if you can hear me yes I can okay I'll wait for it to go live uh, so the recommendation um, is there any other member who wishes to speak on this first? Sorry, I should have asked that. Ca cabinet member. Councillor Ward, did you yes, want to speak? Leader. Yeah, Councillor Ward, wait for you to go live. There yeah. you are. I can't, I can't see it, so... Oh, yeah, there we go. You're um, live now. Yeah, uh, Leader, I'd, I'd just like to say I, I think this is a really productive move um, for Sandown. I, I am the ward councillor. I welcome the investment into into this building, which, as uh, Councillor Tyndall has said, has, has been left em empty for several years. So to see it re uh, brought back into use and for such a good use is very welcome. And I'm sure the people of Sandown will appreciate it and, and of course, the wider community as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ward. Did any other member wish to speak? Councillor Brading. Thank you, Leader. I just want to and, and, you know, come on back. What so Councillor Ward's just said, you know, this is a, a substantial building in the heart of Sandown, you know, the medical centre. Um, it has been underused for many years and it's a fantastic use. Uh, I, yeah, I think you like the mental health services are really important for the young people, especially as we come out of COVID to go back to school. And that's one of the services being provided there. I think it's a great use of a building. It isn't about a capital receipt necessarily for the council, it's about getting most of our assets and to have this building used in this way in Sandown as a, uh, a centre of excellence hub is uh, very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hastie, did you want to speak on this one? Yes, please. Thank you, Leader. Uh, thank you. Ed. I was just uh, from the perspective of our new Coastal Communities Forum, um, which we now put the terms of reference together and we're getting moving forward on that. It's really good to see the use of this sort of building in a coastal town and I endorse that, that the local members have said. Thank you, Leader. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mosdall, just if you wait a few seconds while you go live. You're live. Thank you and I think I should add on an adult social care perspective our locality services are in that building and we've been working um, on an integrated relationship with the trust for many years now. Thank you. Any other member of the cabinet wish to speak on this? Thank you. Uh, so the recommendation which I take uh, Councillor Tyndall you're putting forward is option one to agree the disposal of the Civic Centre oblique barracks to the Isle of Wight NHS for the provision of a community hub with the final details of the disposal to be agreed by the Director of Regeneration in consultation with the Cabinet member. The scrutiny committee, um, having had the background to the proposed recommendation, noted it. Um, do I have a seconder? I'll second it. Uh, Thank you, yeah. you Councillor Ward. Yeah. Um, and I'll ask if officers would take the vote, please. OK, Councillor Stewart. For. Councillor Hastings. For. Councillor Abraham. For. Councillor Brading. For. Councillor Hutchinson. For. Councillor Mosdell. Agreed. Councillor Peace. Agreed. Councillor Tyndall. For. Councillor Ward. For. Councillor Whittle. For. That's unanimous then, Chairman. Thank you very much. I move now to item seven, which is the disposal of Ride Harbour and adjoining land. Um, I am aware that there has been an amendment to the original recommendation that was publicised. I don't know whether the chief executive is able to 
amendment up on the screen. Thank you, Chairman. That is the intention. Uh, we'll do that shortly, but I did want to bring to your attention that Councillor Whittle has withdrawn from the meeting at this point. Uh, yes, because he's actually a ride councillor with a potential interest and that's right and proper he should. Thank you very much for that. Not sure. Yeah. yeah, we now have the, uh, I'll read it out so that members are clear. The, right, the recommendation here is that Ride Town Council are treated as a special purchaser for Ride Harbour and the two parcels of land and the hospitality suite as detailed in their business, subject to one, an independent section 123 valuation of all land proposed to be transferred to Ride Town Council, each party to fund 50% of the costs of the valuation. Two, there being no material objections to the disposal of the land parcel following advertisements placed in accordance with section 123 brackets, 2A close brackets, of the Local Government Act 1972 and three confirmation of how the anticipated <coughs> excuse me loss of budget income of up to £11,166 per annum is to be accommodated within the council's overall revenue budget. That's the recommendation um, from scrutiny. It was noted that clarification will be given at cabinet of the recommended option, which I've just done, and that the future of Ventnor Harbour will be the subject of a separate decision at a later date. And that is what's happening. Does any cabinet member wish to speak on this? Well, I would like to, Dave, very briefly as an introduction. OK, <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, you go live, you're live now. OK, it's just uh, just to confirm as agreed from previous delegated papers the future of both ride and Ventnor harbours were brought to cabinet. Whilst this paper refers to both harbours we are only seeking to make a decision today on ride harbour and the adjoining parcels of land. The future of Ventnor harbour will be determined by a later paper. During the review of the harbours the Isle of Wight Council received a request from Ride Town Council to be considered as a special purchaser. This was considered but was subject to the return of a business case from Ride Town Council. This was received and evaluated by officers last year. This paper presents an overall overview of that process attached, which I'm sure you have read. The paper allows me as a cabinet member to provide you all the following, rec uh, to provide you with the, the recommendation you've just, that's on your screen. And that's all I need to say. Thank you, Councillor Tyndall. Does any other cabinet member wish to speak on this? Yeah, just Councillor Hutchinson. Yeah. Just wait till we go live. There you are. You're you're on screen. We're just waiting to go live. You're live now. Okay. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, this, of course, is the culmination of a lengthy process which was started uh, probably about three years ago now. Um, initially uh, uh, under my uh, stewardship as portfolio holder and and uh, currently under that of Councillor uh, Tyndall. Uh, so there is no change of policy here. I think had it not been for the COVID pandemic, we would probably have got to this position maybe 12 months ago. Uh, and I'm delighted that we now uh, have got to a resolution uh, within the life of the current administration uh, and I see no reason why it should not go forward uh, formally uh, under the conditions that uh, Councillor Tyndall has outlined and with that recommendation in place. Thank you, Leader. Uh, can I just wait for transfer? Thank you, uh, Councillor Hutchinson. Thank you, Councillor Tyndall. Um, I've, I've covered the comments from uh, the scrutiny committee. I take it that Councillor Tyndall is recommending this and that Councillor Hutchinson is seconding it. And if on that basis, I'll now go ask officers to take us to the vote, please. OK, Councillor Stewart. For. Councillor Hastings. For. Councillor Abraham. For. Councillor Brading. For. Councillor Hutchinson. For. Councillor Mosdell. Agreed. Councillor Peace. Agreed. Councillor Tyndall. For. 
And Councillor Ward. Four. And Councillor Whittles not taking part in the voting. Correct. That's unanimous then, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, can we invite Councillor Whittle back into the meeting now, please? Oh. He returns. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll now move to item eight on the agenda, which is uh, the consideration of the report in relation to the government. Somebody's got a rather loud mic. Yeah, I don't know if it's Councillor Tindall or not. We just all mute. Thank you. Um, so this is the, uh, I'll put some context on this and then I'll ask Councillor Whittle to speak on it. Um, members may recall that some time ago now, um, we were looking at how we would best dispose of Dinosaur Isle or how we could develop that as a true asset for the island um, of its very unique nature. This then moved to the development of a proposal which included interest from a very significant investor, which led to a visit to Portugal and a visit to all other tender sites by our officers and lead member at that time. This led to a proposal to give special purchaser status in respect of Dinosaur Isle. And this is about signalling now to the potential investor that the success of this and very ambitious venture, which I've often described as the equivalent of our Disneyland opportunity um, to have a dinosaur um, park, um, the success of the ambitious venture is important to the council as well as to them. But we are uh, uh, right to abide by our procurement process. And I'll ask Councillor Whittle if you wouldn't mind formally introducing the item. And then if any cabinet members to speak, they can. Councillor Whittle. Thank you, Leader. As soon as I get the camera on, I will start. Thank you. So, Dinosaur Isle. This report provides an update of progress with the procurement process to identify a potential partner for investment in Dinosaur Isle. The focus of effort in seeking an investment partner for Dinosaur Isle has been on securing the future for the museum and at the same time delivering a major regeneration opportunity for the Bay. The pandemic has meant progress in discussions with interested parties on the project have been, uh, haven't been as fast uh, as all sides would have hoped, same as most things. We are trying to achieve the best possible outcome in terms of an exciting and significant and significant inward investment alongside maintaining the world leading paleontology collection that Dinosaur Isle is renowned for. The dialogue process to date has been helpful in identifying limitations in the scope of the procurement program process, which could inhibit the most viable commercial proposal to come forward, which would also better secure and sustain the museum collection and museum, museum accreditation in the long term. A review of the scope of the opportunity as the report recommends will ensure that the integrity of the process is not put at risk of challenge whilst providing the best chance of securing a major new attraction for our island. Thank you leader. I would ask members to support this and I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Whittle. Uh, there are a number of questions, um, so I'll invite them in the order they came forward. Uh, questions or comments? Councillor Brading. Thank you, now Leader. Thank you, Leader. Um, this whole area has been part of my history, really. I was brought up here in, the, in Sandown, as you know. You know, I've got great memories of Boaty Lake and grounds long before the dinosaur I was there you know I've, I've falling in the boating lake rowing on the boating lake um, my wife's uncle actually did the brickwork for Pluto during World War Two on that site uh, my daughter actually started work at dinosaur Isle when she was still at school um, it also did the best milkshake and best donuts in the world <laughs> you know, I remember as a kid but um you are the dinosaur uh, thank you 
Cheers, mate. Uh, when, 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 this, when this paper first came forward, I was a bit disappointed in a way that we weren't a little bit further down the line towards the preferred bidder status. Um, and, and this paper really is about, as Councillor Mitchell eloquently said, about uh, getting the procurement process, uh, the scope that we need. And to me, this is really the paper that removes the final hurdle to now progressing to that preferred bidder status and, and getting on with this. Um, it has been a long time, but I appreciate the, you know, the whole process is very complicated. There's been a lot of other crazy ideas put forward about the site, but to me, the, this is the right um, plan to go forward with. Um, I also welcome what will be massive investment in the Bay Area. You know, we've had investment in the sand and grounds recently from Heritage, which although had a bit of negativity to start with, has brought a lot of prosperity to the area. Um, and this huge investment, which will be the biggest investment on the island in this type of thing for many, many years, uh, will be very much welcomed in the Bay. I, I have sort of three comments and questions, really. Um, Council Wizard has already said this one, but you know, the confirmation that the Dinosaur Museum status is absolutely protected and will always be protected. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I've got a bit of a history to, Pu to Pluto with my, uh, my wife's uncle, so I want confirmation really that all the Pluto uh, aspects and buildings on that land will be fully protected. And finally, just, you know, I want confirmation as, as a Sandown Town Councillor that once we've got to the preferred bidder status, the, uh, the bidder will come along to the Bay and do a public consultation of their plans so that everyone in the Bay has the chance to see the plans, see what is going to go, to, you know, hopefully go down there and able to contribute to the plans on behalf of the Bay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Whittle. Do you want to deal with those? Yes, leader, no problem. Just wait with the camera. Yeah. So thank you, uh, Councillor Braden, and I fully understand uh, as a local resident and a local councillor uh, how you feel. And I can assure you, just like we did with Sandham Gardens with Heritage GB, we want to make the dinosaur oil as, as a great uh, uh, attraction as we can for the Bay Area. I can assure you we can ensure that those issues that are addressed that you brought up as part of the review and subsequent dialogue and are covered in any agreement reached. And just like we had the first uh, community and stakeholder consultations at the beginning of this process, we will have exactly the same once we know in what direction we're going to go with the attraction. So I can assure you there will be more public consultation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Brading, for your comments and questions. I'll now ask Councillor Hastings, did you want to comment? Thank you, Leader. I'll just wait for that camera. Thank you, Leader. Yeah, Councillor Whittle, just to really ask, um, how can we ensure that the distinct heritage and environment located in the area is protected? You're live. Yes, everything that is there that has uh, got value to the community as heritage assets will be part of the plan. I think basically when you talk about Pluto, that is an attraction within itself that would benefit any other attraction. So the heritage is always going to be looked after, obviously, but we want to do something that will um, give that well factor back to the Bay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Whittle. Uh, Councillor Abraham. Uh, Good morning. Well, not live yet, you're live now. Um, yeah, just like uh, Councillor Brading, I, I wasn't born in the area, but certainly remember it as a as a young lad going there with the uh, the family and having a, an ice cream at, at Browns. It was always one of those sorts of uh, places you could go for a, for a treat. But um, sadly, Sandown has suffered uh, quite badly o over the years. And I do actually think that this is something that Sandown desperately needs to give it some sort of focus on its uh, for, for it for its future uh, in the holiday and tourism industry. My question actually is, when can we actually actually expect to see this actually happen? Um, you know, it's, we don't want it to go on forever. 
challenging question for Councillor Whittle. I'm sure I have a good answer. Yes, <laughs> I feel the same actually, but these processes have to run their course and they have to be absolutely spot on and correct. So subject to the results of the review and a successful conclusion to the dialogue process, we would hope to see the new attraction open to the public in April 2023. So fingers crossed everybody, no more lockdowns and we should be able to get on with, with our lives again. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Whittle. Uh, and the last one I've got is Councillor Ward. Did you want to question or comment? Uh, thank you, Leader. Yes, I, I have a, a question. Um, but, but before I ask the question, I'd just like to say, um, alongside Councillor Braiding, I was born in Sandown, Canoe Lake, Browns. It's all in my childhood as well. Um, so this, this development is important to me personally and very important to Sandown itself. When I read the paper, I was disappointed that the media um, interpreted the paper as a negative, that there were problems and things like that. When actually we have a bidder here who's come along and wants to invest more than the original invitation to tender. I think that's a, a massive positive and I, I totally agree with the paper. If we have to um, adjust the process and um, to make sure that we are within the procurement rules, then so be it. Um, this is an international company putting a uh, an attraction into Sandown that will have national interest. You know, it, we couldn't have anything better apart from an actual Disneyland, if you like. Um, but say so I'm, I'm very positive. I'm very pleased and I just keep my fingers crossed that this all goes through. Um, but my question um, can we have any more detail regarding the proposal that's still in dialogue? There's there's a there's an information vacuum at the moment, and people are trying to fill that vacuum with spurious um, suggestions. Thank you. Yes. Is there anything you want to say to the comments from Councillor Ward? Yeah. Yes, I've got a, I've got a response to that. If you wait for the cameras on. Okay. So thank you for that, Councillor Ward. Um, it would not be appropriate to discuss these things in advance of the review, but I can say the proposals are extremely ambitious and will put the offer on a different level in terms of national and international significance, going way beyond what we thought possible in the original invitation to tender. So fingers crossed everybody. Thank I'll you. Members to support this paper. Yeah, I'll just check if Councillor Hutchinson wishes to add anything. I saw his name in the. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I'll just wait. To get, yeah, You're I think live. I'm live. Um, just really to comment on the on the time scale uh, on this one, Leader. Um, I know that everybody's been anxious to see things happen, uh, but in projects of this size, and if you take, for example, what would be a fairly routine project for a council, which would be the consultation on the design uh, and planning application for, say, a secondary school, and then the build of that school itself, uh, you are looking at probably five years. Uh, we have been in similar length of consultation with uh, potential bidders for a scheme which is uh, innovative, uh, delivers a great deal more and will actually cost a great deal more. I mean, a typical cost of a secondary school is about 33 million. And we're looking at substantially more than that investment coming into the island. So whilst I, I can appreciate and understand everyone's anxiety to see something happen on the ground, the amount of time that this project has taken is really no different uh, to what one would expect the scale of similar projects, allowing for the fact that we are probably about 12 months behind where we would like to be simply because of the COVID emergency. And taking in that to account, I think we are actually moving forward at a reasonable pace for such a complex project. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hutchinson. Um, it, it's probably typical of the Isle of Wight, but I can tell you as a matter of fact that my mother served keys and coffees at Browns um, and I had to go and collect some of those golf balls that kept disappearing in places they shouldn't. 
Um, so I think a lot of people on the island have an affinity to that location. What I'm aware of, and, and Councillor Whittle has very properly um, made sure we stay within our procurement guidelines, um, is this is a fantastic opportunity for the island. And if all works well, then I think we can see some great success in a town that needs regeneration and deserves regeneration. Um, from the point of view of scrutiny, the background to the proposed recommendation was noted together with the views of the local member. And therefore, um, we can now go to the recommendation, um, which I'll just take a few seconds to get in front of me, unless Councillor Whittle's already got it there. I've got it, Leader, if you want me to read it. Yes, would you mind? Oh, sorry, I just didn't sure. get there already. Yeah. Just wait with the camera again. So the recommendation I would ask members to support is option two, which is undertake a review and assessment of the ITT. That's invitation to tender, by the way, to better understand the viability issues in order to ensure that the procurement process can properly consider the full range of development and investment opportunities to meet the broad objectives of the Council. Officers will report back to the Cabinet with a detailed report of their findings and recommendations at the earliest opportunity anticipated in June 2021. Thank you, Councillor Whittle. So you're proposing that. Do we have a seconder? I'd like to second that, uh, Leader. Yeah. Councillor Ward, thank you very much. So I'll ask officers, you can now take us to the vote. OK, Councillor Stewart. For. Councillor Abraham. For. Councillor Brading. Absolutely for. Councillor Hastings. For. Councillor Hutchinson. For. Councillor Mosdell. Agreed. Councillor Peace. For. Councillor Tyndall. Councillor Tyndall. Yeah, Councillor Ward. Four. And Councillor Whittle. Four. That's unanimous, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, officers. Um, I'm now going to move to the next item on the agenda, which is Cabinet Member Announcements, item nine. Um, and invite Cabinet Members to provide a brief update where they wish to on their portfolios. Um, I have already been notified that Councillor Brading wishes to give an update and I'll invite him to speak first. Thank you, Leader. I, I, I can't promise it'd be too brief because I think there's quite a lot going on at the moment, uh, but I, I'd like just want to touch on key areas of my portfolio and also with some COVID bits uh, to add some meat on the bones as well. Um, if I start with just children's services, the simplest thing I can say is that the service has still been operating business as usual right throughout the pandemic. Um, all meetings have been conducted on time, virtually and face to face as required, sometimes alternating between the two. Um, I just want to say I'm incredibly proud I am of every member of the children's services team for the way they've adapted and continue to look after our young children and young people at this incredible time. Um, Touch on education, um, all schools opened successfully on the 8th of March. Um, again, all school staff have worked so hard to implement the public health guidance to reduce the risk of transmission of COVID to a minimum. Their focus has been on you know, hygiene advice, one way systems, working in bubbles, face coverings, ventilation, social distancing and, and also the staggering of starts, finishes and breaks. Um, touching on the testing, uh, all staff in primary schools are already tested with lateral flow tests at home twice a week and all staff and students in secondary schools are now being tested three times a week at school to start with under supervision, then at home twice a week. One thing also that may be missed is that households with children in education could also have lateral flow tests and do them at home, which they can order them online um, and also, you know, that was a, a fact that perhaps has not been widely broadcast. Um, exam results this year, I'm really pleased that there's real uh, definition now at the very early part of the year that um, coursework, mock exams, and there will be op um, optional tests set by examination board that will feed into the uh, appropriate GCSE and A-level results this year. I want to touch on the winter grant scheme that we called Connect for Communities. Um, basically, from the start of December, 
Last year, we were given £457,000 for our winter grant scheme, uh, mainly with five purposes. It was free school meals, vouchers for a wider cohort, as well as care leavers and young carers. We had a discretional school grant pot that we gave for schools to allocate to families they were aware may need some assistance. We had an open pot for individuals to apply for. We had a holiday uh, and play scheme incorporating meals for February half term. And we had a community grant pot where we gave out £113,000 in 23 different grants to help lots of small organisations that were really doing fantastic work in our community. I can actually say or tell you hot off the press really, we've now just received another £159,000 to be used by the 16th of April. So it basically covers the Easter school break. Um, and I've agreed literally this afternoon, I've just agreed that we have 71,000 pound of our existing pot to carry forward. So together we've got 229,000 to be used by the 16th of April uh, as further help for families and young people. So what we've agreed is that we will continue to do free school meal vouchers, at three pound a day right through the two week Easter school holiday. We're also going to continue to support care leavers and young carers. We're going to have another continue to do the community grant pot, uh, further discretionary pots for schools. We're going to help early year settings because they didn't get any help in the first tranche, so we're going to help our early year settings. We're going to set up a white goods pot, a fuel support pot, um, and even got some Easter cooking schemes. So there's lots more of information we just agreed this afternoon. There'll be further details in the press during the next day or so, and that's what we're going to do with the further money we've received. The government, last December, the government also announced that uh, after the winter grant scheme finished, they would have something further in place from April. They've called it HAF, Holiday Activities and Food Programme. We've been given for that £408,000, and it was also be providing activities between April and the end of the year four to four hours, four days a week for six weeks. And we're uh, currently going through the uh, process of getting bidders uh, to offer these sort of schemes. So when you add that up, in total, we've been given for families and young people support 1.024 million since the start of December. Um, and not as, uh, it shouldn't really be underplayed how much this has made a difference and how well we've spent it. So I want to thank Suzanne, Cathy and all the teams that have allocated this money out in such a professional way. A couple of other quick things. Um, the delegated decision on the SEN banding structure has already now been made, and that will really, really help um, give flexibility on the system to schools, parents and children on educational health care plans. And also, it um, was portrayed as a money saving exercise. Quite the opposite, in fact, we've got 341,000 extra into the pot to cater for uh, children on EHCPs. Um, Ofsted has not been a, a highly mentioned topic lately, but Ofsted, Ofsted judgments in the, the usual way were suspended during the pandemic. But virtual Ofsted visits did take place, with the judgment really looking at how well schools have responded to COVID requirements, but also gave you know, some other general comments on what, what they saw from their virtual visits. Um, all reports we've had regarding the COVID requirements has been really strong. But what is also encouraging is that um, the three secondary schools in the island that currently uh, aren't rated as good have had visits and in all cases considerable progress has been recognised. So I'm confident that when these three schools are inspected, we could be in a position where 100% of secondary schools on the island are rated as good by Ofsted. Which is, which is such considerable progress from the mess we inherited four years ago. I just want to conclude, this is you know, the last cabinet of this administration, uh, and I don't want to take the opportunity to say um, some thank yous, if I may. I want to say thank you to my Director of Children's Services, Steve Crocker, my Assistant Director of Education and Inclusion, Brian Pope, my Assistant Director of Children and Family, Stuart Ashley, and my Head of Strategy and Operations, Kathy Marriott, for making my role the last four years enjoyable, and as easy as possible. It's all about teamwork though, I appreciate that and I've always had that ethos in my working life. So I want to say a massive thank you to every member of Children's Services and Education for the amazing jobs that they do 
and I'm proud to be part of the team. We've achieved so much in the last four years and assuming it all goes well on the 6th of May, I look forward to delivering on the exciting future plans we've already been discussing. So, sorry it's a long report leader, but I thank you for indulging me. Thank you. Well, thank you, Paul. Now that's um, a very comprehensive report um, reflecting the investment that government are making on the island in our young children. Uh, and I think that's really important. Now I've got Councillor Steve Hastings. Did you want to speak? Yes, please, leader. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, first thing, I have uh, two things I want to mention. First thing is green garden waste. You'll be um, pleased to hear that we now have out of 10,000 potential subscriptions, we have 9,962. Wow. So my message this evening is anybody who hasn't got around to it yet, uh, the subscriptions will be open until the 19th of March. That's tomorrow week. There are 38 left, so don't all rush at once, but make sure you get in before the 19th. Thank you for that. Um, now, my next thing is I've dealt quite a lot recently, and in fact, you and I got involved in one in some fly tipping, litter and fly tipping. I don't know if people have noticed, but there seems to me a lot more litter around. We have some excellent residents in places all over the island that go litter picking. That's great. But my view is we have to do something about it. Now, if you bear with me, Leader, I'm just going to read what I've got written here. I've got by way of a, my introduction followed by a proposal that I'd like to put forward with your approval. The island is a special and unique place, blessed with areas of outstanding natural beauty, granted UNESCO biosphere status and numerous sites of special scientific interest, conservation areas, historic townships and amazing wildlife. Sadly, as we have all too often seen regularly being polluted and harmed by those few individuals who simply do not seem to care for the island. Littering and fly tips drop from cars in the countryside, along our coastline, in our town centre and in our car parks is unforgivable. <coughs> Bless you, leader. In this modern age, my wife and I often spend our weekends litter picking in hedgerows, beaches, etc. And we are horrified at the steady stream of plastic bottles, broken glass and takeaway food and drink packages disregarded. There is simply no excuse. But condemning those who litter and fly tip is not enough. We need to seek a proactive, coordinated approach to ensure this island is kept clean and where possible, those who litter and those who fly tip are identified and enforcement action is taken. Now, moving forward to my proposal, the Environmental Protection Act 1990 as amended mandates the local authority duties for waste on land and our responsibilities as the Waste Collection and Disposal Authority and the Litter Authority. We have to date achieved great things and great changes in our waste and recycling strategy and now see it as the right time to advance our future direction on fly tipping and litter to support our vision for the Isle of Wight to be an inspiring place in which to grow up, work, live and visit and our corporate objective for the environment and unique island characteristics to be celebrated. I would like to propose a litter and fly tipping task and finish group led by senior council officers and cross party members uh, is immediately raised with the objective to develop a litter and fly tipping strategy and associated two year rolling action plan. As you know, leader, I do like a strategy to have to have an action plan to enshrine the best practice principles in the code of practice on litter and refuse are built upon with an outcome of reducing litter, minimizing fly tipping and enhancing our environmental education and enforcement through innovation and strong leadership. With your approval, I would like to set that, that um, task and finish group up, Leader. Thank you. I'll wait for it to go live again. It's all right, Cat, Chief Exec, got your message. Um, so, uh, Councillor Ward, I note you want to second it. 
I think the process to follow, obviously, as the cabinet member for environment and heritage, it's within your gift to organise um, various activities, and you've certainly done that. And I'd just like to thank you personally, because I know you and uh, your other half have been out collecting litter. Um, and I know that uh, you and I um, have been working with officers to clear the complete mess at Whale Chine, which is a fantastic island destination, blemished by these characters. And I would say to anybody publicly listening, if you see people fly tipping and you can get any evidence at all, car numbers or whatever, just report it to the police because we don't need that on the island. Um, in terms of the task and finish group, I think it's within your gift to do that, but I think it would be good if you could bring a report back to a future meeting just so that we can formalise that. Um, I don't think that stops you getting on with it um, and an action plan. I agree with you again. Um, so if we do that and we get a report and uh, we'll work through the chief executive to make sure that we get this underway. But I know where you're coming from. We need to act now. Um, we sit on an island which we claim to be, you know, a biosphere. And the area of outstanding natural beauty has got some of the best coastline in the world um, and some of the most amazing uh, scenery and environment, which everybody's going to come out of lockdown and want to enjoy. And I suspect the last thing they need to see is, is all this litter spread everywhere. So I'm, uh, I'm totally in favour of the principle that you have come forward with. I'll ask you to liaise with the chief inspector, chief, inspector, chief executive, <laughs> um, who I'm sure will point you in the light process way. But I think the principle, absolutely, um, and what a good idea. Um, and if it means that one or two people get caught when they should be uh, caught, hard luck on them, because I think the island needs and deserves to be looked after. And I will thank all those people across the island who just do this on a daily basis. Go out collecting yeah. litter, making your... And if in the process you can find the dog bin that was stolen from uh, the Viewpoint car park, I'll be very grateful because we could do with that as well. So thank you very much, Councillor. Thank you, Leader. Uh, just, just to say uh, to the Chief Executive, probably I would assume that we would report back through policy and scrutiny of neighbourhoods. Does that make sense? All right. Do you want to comment on it, Councillor? Yeah, Chief Executive. I think Chairman, as the as the responsible cabinet member, it's for Council Hastings to determine how we might want to take that policy forward and how we might want to fund it from within his overall budget. It yep. becomes a matter for Cabinet when the policy comes back for approval and requires funding. So I think yep. it's perfect. He's perfectly within his gift to take that away and develop that with officers and bring something back, perhaps as part of the wider climate change and environment strategy. Absolutely. Uh, it's already in preparation. But thank yeah. you. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, well, Sorry, Leader, if you can just bear with me for two more seconds. Yeah, no, that's fine. Just a couple of things more to say on that. You uh, wait to go live. Thank You're you. Live just, now. Whilst, whilst I am looking to set this up and I can just tell you that we had last year on the island 525 um, incidents of fly tipping. Um, now, I, I think one is too many. However, other parts in on the mainland, for instance, Woken Borough Council 1298 and Middlesbrough 4411. So we're, we're not terrible. But as I said, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, one is too many. So if we can do something and we don't want to get there, do we? We want, don't want to end up in a place where we have that number. Thank you, Leader, and thank you, Chief Executive. Thank you, Councillor Hastings. Uh, I move now to Councillor Mosdor. Wait for you to go live. You're live now. Thank you, Leader. Um, I'm pleased to provide an update about adult social care and housing needs, but rather than provide my usual update of activities across my portfolio, I'd like to be a little bit more reflective. This cabinet meeting is the closest to the one year anniversary of the first COVID-19 national lockdown, which happened on the 23rd of March 2020. So this is a moment first and foremost to remember those islanders who have died from the virus as well as their families and friends who continue to grieve and mourn the loss of a loved one. This island is, relatively speaking, a small community, and so we all know or at least know of a family whose lives have been torn asunder by the death of a loved one due to catching this terrible virus. Our thoughts and prayers go out to them this evening. This is a moment also to think about people still suffering from the effects of COVID, including those people with long COVID whose physical system symptoms persist. 
And this is a moment to think about the negative impact on many people's mental health. Some of them have been thrown into crisis. And this is a moment to think about people who have suffered homelessness during the pandemic, some due to losing their jobs, others escaping domestic violence, and others who have been the island's hidden homeless, but have now approached the council for accommodation and support. And this is certainly a moment to thank our brilliant frontline workers for their tireless and heroic work. Without them, none of us would have got through this past year. Our local NHS, the people who work across this very council, including the adult social care, housing and public health services, which are in my portfolio, the island's independent care providers, the people working in our supermarkets and on the buses and the ferries, our voluntary and community organisations who have reached out to so many, all have been magnificent. Without their selfishness, professionalism and hard work, we would have all fared a lot, lot worse during this last past dark year. They have placed themselves in harm's way for the benefit of others and we all owe them our profound thanks and our utmost respect. I recognise that we are approaching an election on the island in May. <coughs> Tonight, I want to focus on what reunites us, not divides us. In my lifetime, never has there been a year where the word community has mattered more. Never has there been such a need to ensure that our most vulnerable citizens are supported and cared for. And never has there been a year where frontline workers, be they from the public or the private sector, have mattered more to every single one of us in keeping us safe and keeping us whole. This past year has been difficult and dark and at times overwhelming, but it also given us a clear view as to what is best on this island, and it is the people. I started my speech this evening remembering those islanders who had died from COVID and the families and the friends who mourn them. These families and friends mourn still, and Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who was once an eminent psychiatrist, described so well the five stages of their grief which are denial, anger, bargaining, depression and acceptance. And in many ways, those sages also describe our varied experiences and responses during the pandemic. But I think our response to COVID-19 needs a six stage resolution. As we gradually, carefully and responsibly move out of the worst clutches of this pandemic and lockdown rules are eased, our resolution must be ensure that the reset of our public services builds upon the strength that our communities have shown throughout the pandemic and pri prioritise the needs of the weakness. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mosdall. That was uh, very well spoken and very well prepared. I'll move now to Councillor Gary Peace. Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, I'd just like to say um, and express my sincere condolences for Adrian's uh, family and friends. Um, I didn't know him particularly well, but uh, what I do know, he was a, a complete and utter gentleman uh, whenever I dealt with him uh, and, and spoke with him. Um, and I think he's going to be a sad loss to everybody. Um, so if we move on to the uh, my portfolio, so with regards to community safety team, um, Essentially, there's a load of work going on at the moment, planning for recovery uh, and enabling business to start reopening. And in conjunction with our partners to help this, this uh, process along, uh, we're actually starting some more Zoom webinars starting from the 24th of March. Um, and that's going to be a focus on uh, tourism and hospitality initially. But we're also going to touch on obviously event planning because that's a big thing for the island. So that's what they're going to be doing. So 24th of March Zoom webinars um, to help businesses move along. <clears throat> and then obviously um, I'm a parent and for all those other parents out there, we're going to be critically aware that uh, schools have started up again this week and probably quite a lot of us are going to be celebrating uh, because the kids have gone back. Um, and with that in mind, we've had COVID support officers out uh, at school gates um, at uh, drop off and pick up times to make sure that those the inevitable gatherings that uh, that happen when people come in and out of those premises are done in a, in a COVID safe way. Um, and I think that's that's working really well with the support we're able to give to those schools. Um, now, looking at 
everything that's happened during um, COVID, we've all become very uh, accustomed now to home deliveries from restaurants and takeaways and so on and so forth. But actually what it's done is it's shown up a, a few issues around um, uh, parking uh, and congestion with, with deliveries being made and so on and so forth. Um, and that's, that's presented a few challenges that perhaps uh, we weren't quite aware of or weren't planning on. Um, so the team are looking into that now to see what we can and can't do around um, trying to enforce things and, and making sure that um, the way things are now, um, uh, it's not going to change anytime soon. We're still going to be doing these deliveries, but we want to make sure that uh, those deliveries don't cause too much inconvenience to uh, homeowners. <coughs> I want to touch on dogs on beaches now some time back uh, when we had the public safety protection rules that came out um, I gave a commitment that officers would officers would would hold uh, almost an informal review of uh, allowing dogs on beaches at certain times of the year and so on and so forth uh, that work was has been delayed obviously because of covid and the officers were tied up with other things but I can confirm um, and I, this is in response to a couple of questions I've had from the media and from Ventnor Town Council, um, the officers are continuing to work on um, on this uh, this issue, uh, and they will and are going out to town councils now um, to gather opinions, uh, and they're going to do so as quickly as possible so that we can get something uh, we can have some sort of uh, considered view and opinion uh, prior to the season starting. <coughs> um, next, if I turn to our IT, um, the IT team are recruiting. Uh, which is which is great news. Um, it means you know we're taking on extra people. Um, so with that in mind, if anyone out on the Isle of Wight or further afield wants to join the Isle of Wight Council uh, and the IT team, which is a and it's been proven during the last year uh, to be a really successful and high performing team, then to have a look and and think about applying to join the Isle of Wight Council as one of our IT uh, specialists. Um, lastly, I want to move on to uh, LeBlanc, which is something that I've uh, championed for a while. Um, and uh, I just want to confirm LeBlanc are back on. Uh, they have confirmed new dates um, and it's going ahead. It's planned for the, 9th, the 17th and 19th of September, which just happens to be the same time as the proposed uh, festival dates. Um, but it's it's going to work, work well. All the parties are on board as originally envisaged. Um, and again, it's going to be based at the Royal Hotel in Ventnor. Uh, the only slight change is uh, originally we were going to get uh, Raymond Blanc as the lead chef for the event. Well, because of the change in dates, Raymond Blanc now longer can't do it. But actually, it's worked out really well because he's now swapping uh, with another two star Michelin chef called uh, Claude Bossy. Um, he was going to be doing uh, Le Blanc in Champagne in France. And quite simply, what, what they've done is Bossy is now shot, swapped with uh, with Roma Blanc uh, and he's going to be doing the Isle of Wight, uh, the Isle of Wight Le Blanc. Um, as I say, it is, he's a he's a two star Michelin chef. Perhaps his profile isn't as great, at least in the UK, as it was for for Roman Blanc. But just to give you a bit of background, um, he's got his own top class restaurant in London. Um, it's in the Michelin House uh, up in I think it's Clapham. Um, and actually, there's a good link there because Michelin are also one of the major partners for the, the Le Blanc event. Um, so there's a there's a really good time there and just to again reaffirm to everybody out there that uh, this is a very much an Isle of Wight thing and it benefits the Isle of Wight economy and all of our businesses so we've got the Royal Hotel they are going to be accommodating the guests uh, and hosting the meals we've got the Isle of Wight distillery and our own mermaid gin uh, they're full on, you know fully on board um, we've got the chefs from Tramazzini's one of I think one of probably the one of the best restaurants on the Isle of Wight that's the chefs from Tramazzini Adam in particular is going to be helping to cook those that food um, and perhaps one of the the other one of the most important things for the island in general and for the investment that's been pushed into this and the the amount of um, uh, the headlines that we are going to get as an Isle of Wight is there is £350,000 worth of media investment going into this and that directly promotes the island. Um, lastly the, the swap is is actually quite really quite significant um, and I can't go into too many details at the moment um, 
but the the change uh, of of lead chef with with Claude Bossy comes coming in uh, is really quite a significant one because he's got some he's got some plans around the Isle of Wight uh, which will make a significant impact to the hospitality industry uh, in the next year here on the island. Uh, and lastly, um, following on from what Paul said, I'd just like to say thank you very much to all the team uh, that. Um, that I work with as part of my portfolio because you've all been absolutely brilliant stars and I couldn't have done this job without you. So thank you, Leader. Thank you, uh, Gary. Very, very comprehensive. Um, I think the last uh, person to speak, uh, and I'm sorry, just on that, I think that's an example of the work that's now going on to recover our economy, which we're going to need to do as we move away from the lockdown. Um, Councillor Ward, I think you wanted to speak. Thank you, Leader. Uh, Leader, I, I just wanted to give a short update um, on the Newport traffic plan. As you, right. as I announced at the last cabinet meeting, um, we're moving on to phase two, which is the St George's Way um, improvement. I gave a, a a brief update on the on the project at that meeting. Um, that did actually say that the, uh, the, the the plan needed to be finalised, and, uh, and and you know we would be consulting with others. Um, I'm pleased to say that we have a uh, we've consulted with the relevant Newport members who had a few issues um, that needed to be addressed. We've we've addressed those, hopefully to to everybody's satisfaction. So the project will be starting fairly soon, um, and barring any unknowns we should be finished about the end of July. Thank you, Leader. Thank you very much, Councillor Ward. Any other cabinet members wish to speak? No, um, I've got a couple of comments to make. Um, first of all, um, and it collects through all the work that's going on with the cabinet members, um, our three primary goals of keeping the community safe, of economic recovery, and of a sound financial sustainable base um, have all proved to be taking us in the right direction and uh, I'm grateful for that. Um, I'm also uh, grateful to the cabinet team who for the last four years have stuck to my uh, expectation of being professional, ethical and acting with integrity um, and I'm grateful for that and finally although he doesn't want me to do it I'm going to thank Councillor Hutchinson for his total commitment and support during my time as leader of this council. Um, he brings with himself wisdom, calmness, and usually a very uh, appropriate level of thought. Um, but uh, that's, I just want to get that on the record. So um, as he slips into the next stage of his life, whatever that may be, um, then I thank him. You don't need to respond, Councillor Hutchison. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so Thank you for those kind words, Leader. <laughs> it's the least I can say, I think. Um, we're going to shortly move into um, two items which will be heard in camera or in private. Um, it's well documented in the papers. Uh, one of the items, uh, I think, uh, Councillor Garrett, who's a local ward member, is affected by um, and if he's still on the line, I will invite him to come to the start of that meeting on that item so that he can speak in private. And the reason all these things are um, uh, in private and we will need to exclude members of the press when we get there uh, is because, uh, and I'll repeat this when we get to the item, um, we need to do so under the local authorities' executive arrangements. Um, can I just check uh, if there are any items remaining on the forward plan that we need to do? Normally, Brad, Councillor Brading deals with that for me. Um, I'm pleased to say, Leader, though, there's only after tonight, there's only one more delegated decision to be made, and that falls to me. Um, and obviously, then there's the, the lull till we start the forward plan again, um, the new administration to carry on with. So, no, we are, have dealt with every matter we need to deal with. OK. Um, so, uh, the last item on the public agenda is members questions. I haven't been notified of any members questions that were submitted by uh, two democratic services no later than Tuesday 9th of March. But in order to deal with that effectively, what I would say to any member listening who might like to have asked a question, um, if you submit the question to the relevant cabinet member, we will make sure that that is responded to in writing 
um, so that you have the answer you require before the end of this term. I'm Councillor moving... Stewart, sorry, could I just come in? Sorry, it's Councillor PC Wilcox. I thought um, I didn't realise we had to put questions ahead in advance. It just says que members question time. I thought we could just ask questions. Sorry. Um, well, you can ask the question. What I'm saying is the answer won't come to you directly now. We'll make sure you get a written reply because the question live, if you like, won't have been prepared for. And I want to make sure any member who has a question can uh, get the answer they require. Got Councillor Hutchinson, are you indicating do you want to just speak? I'm not sure. Uh, no. Thank you, Nida. No, uh, not, not on. I'll put the on for a second. Yeah, you're on now. We'll just wait a few seconds to go live. Uh, 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 no, not on this particular topic, uh, Alida, but I just wanted to, um, uh, as we've touched, a number of council, uh, cabinet members have touched on the, the COVID issues. Um, yes. And certainly I, I, I can't and wouldn't compete with uh, Councillor Mosdell's uh, speech from the heart about the impact and the rebuild as we leave the worst of COVID behind us. But I'd just like to remind members that at the Health and Wellbeing uh, Board, which meets next week uh, on Thursday, a week today, uh, that there is an update item uh, covering all elements of COVID and that will be reported in public. Thank you. Thank you. Um, going back to Councillor PC Wilcox. Yeah, within our um, constitution, questions for this committee need to be submitted by the date. Um, so I'm going to ask you to submit the question to us if you wish to get an answer. I won't deal with it now uh, in the open session so that I'm not treating anybody any differently to any other member currently or in the past. Um, so I'm going to uh, move now to item 12, which excludes in the public. I'll read this out so that it's on the record. To consider passing a resolution that under regulation 42B of the local authorities executive arrangements, meetings and access to information, brackets England regulations 2012, the public and press to be excluded from the meeting for the following items of business, namely agenda items 13 on the grounds that there is likely to be disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraph three of part one of the schedule 12A of the Act and in the, all in the consequences of the case, the public interest is in maintaining the exemption outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information. I just ask the cabinet uh, if they support going into private session, uh, but I'll just check with our, our uh, monitoring officer who's appeared to make sure I've done everything we should. Uh, uh, nice to meet you, Chris. You're the you're the secret guardian behind the world. Uh, thank you, thank you, Leader. Just just to add um, to the um, proposed uh, exclusion resolution, uh, that item uh, 14 is yeah. added, um, and the reasons for 14 are in relation to paragraphs one and paragraphs three. Uh, basically uh, information which would reveal the identity of an individual and information relating to the financial or business affairs of, of uh, any person. Uh, so subject to that addition, um, I have no further comment to make. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, and just on this, um, I'll just get the Cabinet to approve that course of conduct. Um, and uh, so I'll go around the Cabinet now. So I, I agree we should. I'll ask the officer if she'll just go around the Cabinet. OK. Um... Councillor Brading. Agreed. Councillor Abraham. Agreed. Councillor Hastings. Agreed. Councillor Hutchinson. Agreed. Councillor Mosdell. Agreed. Councillor Peace. Agreed. Councillor Tyndall. Agreed. Councillor Ward. Agreed. Councillor Whittle. Agreed. And yourself, Chairman, you said that you yes, agreed. Yes, I agreed. Yeah, yes. That's everyone then. Yep. So members of the public listening, effectively that closes the meeting because we're now going into a private session. I thank you for listening. I hope you found it informative. I thank the Cabinet for their transparency and I thank our officers for their support. And we'll now go into closed session. Members, you need to come, Cabinet members, you need to come out of this meeting and go into the different uh, setting. And we'll now leave the meeting.